Most people think of fishing as a mindless activity, but this couldn't be further from the truth. Sitting in the same spot for hours, waiting for a bite is just one way to fish, and it's pretty boring. If you want to catch more fish, big fish, and have fun doing it, you've got to be willing to put in the work. There's a lot to be learned, and it can be overwhelming, so I'm going to cover a few things I've picked up over the years to speed up your progress. If you're new to the sport, struggling to catch fish, or looking for a refresher, you've come to the right place. Let's get started. If you're in the US, you'll probably be targeting one of the following. Bass, trout, panfish, or something toothy. And if you're not landlocked, you may have access to striper, more toothy fish, or something less common. Although they differ in size, shape, and color, most will share the suggestive appearance of a fish, AKA a hunk of meat with fins and a face. But there's a lot more to fish than most people realize. Let's take a quick look at some anatomical features. Most of the fish you'll encounter will have seven fins, one dorsal, one caudal, one anal, two pelvic, and two pectoral. Each serves its own function and works in concert with the others to perform thrust, balance, steering, and braking. This allows fish to hold their position in current, maneuver like an ace pilot, or take off like a shot. Some species have an adipose fin, which was thought to be vestigial, but scientists have recently proposed that it may be used to detect the flow of water. Closer inspection of the fins will show spines, rays, or a combination of the two. The stiff pointed spines located anteriorly provide support to the fins and protection from predators, while the soft rays are more flexible and aid in movement. This is an area you need to be mindful of when handling fish, because getting spined is a pain you won't soon forget. We'll cover this later. While their eyes appear similar to ours, most fish see things differently than humans. The placement of their eyes and focusing mechanisms allow some species a wide field of view and sharp eyesight. It's also important to note that absorption, reflection, and refraction of light play a role in how fish and humans view things above and below the water's surface. The explanation is a bit heavy for our discussion today, so the takeaway here is that most fish will see you before you see them. The thin stripe running along the side of the fish is referred to as the lateral line, and it's not just for show. This sensitive organ allows for the detection of pressure changes via mucus-filled tubes connected to nerves. It gives fish the ability to sense vibrations, which is important for feeding, spatial orientation, avoiding predation, and even spawning. Gills are a unique structure that allow fish to breathe underwater. The arches support a series of filaments lined with blood-filled capillaries that allow the extraction of dissolved oxygen from the water and the expulsion of carbon dioxide from the body. In this system, water must pass through the fish's mouth, over the filaments, and out the side of its head. This is accomplished as the fish drops its jaw and opens its opercula, creating a negative pressure in its mouth, forcing water over the gills. In addition to breathing, opercula provide protection and facial support. These bony structures overlie the soft, fleshy gills, shielding them from harm, and in some cases, inflicting damage upon anglers. Although you should never touch the gills of any fish, some species have very sharp gill plates that can cut your hands, something we'll cover later. Aside from sucking in water, fish use their mouths to feed, fight, and even move objects. While some have many small inward-facing teeth, others have prominent fang-like structures and powerful jaws that allow them to capture their prey and hang on tight. Needless to say, it's a good idea to look before you grip a fish by the mouth with bare hands. Situated somewhere between the eyes and upper lip of the fish are the nares, a pair of openings on each side of the snout. As water passes through, fish can smell and sense chemical changes, which allows for detecting mates, avoiding predators, and in some cases, navigation. Contrary to popular belief, nares are not used for respiration, but chemoreception only. Scales are like little plates of armor that help the fish blend into its surroundings. There are different types varying by size, shape, color, hardness, and texture. Besides species identification, it's also possible to determine the age and growth rate of a fish from looking at a scale under the microscope. Something more useful to marine biologists, 
but interesting to anglers nevertheless. Covering the scales is a translucent, sticky substance known as the slime coat. This mucus-like secretion acts as the first line of defense against infection, and it actually helps reduce drag on the fish's body in water. This important feature is often overlooked by new anglers when practicing catch and release, when they touch a fish with dry hands. Doing so removes a portion of the slime coat and the good bacteria it contains, leaving the fish vulnerable to parasites and infection. We'll talk about how to avoid this later. Now that you know a little anatomy, let's talk about different species and how we describe them. Taxonomy is a system of classifying organisms that scientists use to communicate. You've seen the diagram they use. It reads domain, kingdom, phylum, class, and so on. Each section of the hierarchy provides information about organisms, like structural components, movement, reproduction, and much more. Anglers need only be concerned with the last two divisions because they allow us to classify any living thing in a matter of seconds with little confusion. Binomial nomenclature, as it's called, uses the genus and species to point to a specific organism, whereas the use of common names leaves room for error. For example, using the term bass could suggest a number of species like smallmouth, spotted, spottail, striper, black sea bass, or Florida bass. Using the scientific name, Micropter salmoides, avoids this issue because it's assigned only to one specific fish with the common name of largemouth bass. It's not something that you necessarily need to know, but it can definitely be helpful when you want to learn more about a species of fish you're targeting. Because they are so widespread, bass are probably the most popular game fish in America. They're found in creeks, rivers, lakes, and ponds almost everywhere, and they can be caught year-round on a variety of lures. Well known for their aggressive behavior, aerial displays, and resilient nature, hobbyists and pros chase after these little green tanks religiously. When properly handled by anglers, this warm water fish tolerates air exposure much better than less robust varieties. Of the many species in the black bass genus, we'll discuss two. Micropterus salmoides, more commonly known as largemouth bass, are green with white bellies and a broken dark horizontal stripe spanning the length of their side. As the name implies, they have big mouths that allow them to scarf down other fish, crustaceans, mice, snakes, ducklings, you name it. Adults can reach over 20 pounds, but most anglers catch those in the 1 to 5 pound class. Micropterus dolomew, or smallmouth bass, are olive and bronze with dark vertical bands and white bellies. Their mouths are smaller than their cousins, but that doesn't stop them from devouring fish, insects, crayfish, and frogs with gusto. Although adults max out around 12 pounds, smallmouth are known for putting up an intense fight. While trout are less accessible than bass, they certainly receive a lot of notice from anglers. There's just something about chasing beautiful fish in beautiful places that makes you forget about life for a while. Often selective, and at times elusive, they can be a challenge to target, which could explain why people obsess over them. Shaped by natural selection, their slender bodies and powerful tails make them highly efficient, capable of outswimming baitfish, crustaceans, and mice, although their diet consists mostly of insects early on. Cool water rich in oxygen is crucial to their survival, so it goes without saying that they don't like to be exposed to the air for too long. They tend to be fragile, so proper handling techniques are important in the landing process. Agencies across the U.S. recognize their fragility, so they are prioritized through restocking programs, management areas, and restoration projects. There are too many species of trout to cover, but everyone knows the big three. Oncorhynchus mycus, known to anglers as rainbow trout, are part of the Semonidae family. Their olive sides are peppered with black spots and fade into a silvery or pale underside. Following their lateral line is a touch of pink, almost as if Mother Nature added a stroke of blush before she was done with them. Native to the Pacific coast, Anglers can find 12 to 20 inches hiding in creeks and rivers throughout the states, but fully grown adults can reach up to 40 inches. Salmotruta are also salmonids, but they're a bit less flashy. Their golden and smoky sides are flecked with black spots, while their red spots are surrounded by blue halos. Originally introduced to America from Germany, adults can reach up to 44 pounds, but the average angler will more commonly find fish 20 inches or less in length. 
Salvelinus fontanalis are technically char, but everyone calls them brook trout. Besides their pale yellow patches, red dots, and blue halos, the pastel and blazing red bellies of spawning trout can be very visually pleasing. Vermiculations and spots in the dorsal, adipose, and caudal fins seem to disappear in the remaining appendages, which are instead lined red, black, and white. Native to Canada, the Hudson Bay area, and the eastern states, they thrive in cool water with ample overhead cover, but they have been successfully introduced to the western U.S. and other countries. While adults can reach up to 14 pounds, anglers are likely to pin specimens 10 inches or less. Panfish is a term that anglers use to describe smaller varieties of fish that fit in a frying pan. Although they don't all share the same taxonomic family, they seem to share a preference for easy meals. Yellow perch, crappy, and most of the true sunfish are a few panfish considered to be a great introduction for young anglers because they are so abundant and easy to catch. Aside from feeding on algae, zooplankton, and insects, they have been known to terrorize game fish by preying on their young. But the food web makes up for this because they become a source of protein for bass, trout, and pickerel. Pike, pickerel, and muscalunge all belong to the Esox genus, a category of fish with elongated bodies, sharp teeth, and a highly aggressive nature. While some species, like the redfin pickerel, max out around 12 inches, most anglers are concerned with larger, more elusive species like musky, which can reach over 60 inches in length. For those of us without a boat, striper are a highly revered saltwater game fish. Their silver bodies are lined with horizontal stripes, running from gill plate to a broad, powerful tail fin, which allows them to navigate strong currents and take advantage of struggling food forms. Aside from their impressive size and brute force, their appetite sends anglers running when they show up in the surf, inlets, and back bays. Their preference for cool water forces them up and down the east coast each year, where they forage for crustaceans, eels, squid, and other fish. Although they can be difficult to catch, sport anglers and commercial vessels have decimated striped bass stocks over the years, which is why this species is so tightly managed today. Unlike some of the freshwater fish we discussed, sea trout are not salmonids. Rather, they are members of the drum family, but everyone calls them sea trout, speckled trout, and gator trout. These bronze and silver beauties certainly resemble salmonids with their spotted sides and fan-like tails, but their notched dorsal fin and prominent canine teeth suggest otherwise. Common to the Gulf Coast and South Atlantic states, this estuarine fish is found inshore along salt marshes, tidal creeks, and other shallow water features, but they can be taken offshore as well. Your average speck isn't terribly hard to catch once you find her, but the large adults reaching up to 35 inches, known as gator trout, are a bit less common. Red drum, redfish, or reds as they are sometimes called, are a favorite among southern anglers. Although they don't jump when hooked, they're known for putting up a good fight, especially on light tackle. Their root beer and iridescent copper backs fade into pearl white bellies, while black spots near the tail distract your attention. Scattered along the Atlantic and Gulf coasts, they can be found around oyster beds, salt marshes, and open beaches. Foraging for crab, shrimp, and bait fish. While they can reach over 90 pounds in weight, bull reds are less common than their smaller counterparts, known as puppy drum. Unfortunately, their mild flavor became a favorite with foodies and anglers, greatly reducing their numbers, but commercial fishing is no longer legal and these fisheries are carefully managed today. Bluefish are another hard fighter that make runs along the Atlantic coast and there are no short supply. Like the name says, they have a blue to green hue along their backs, but they generally appear gray and white. The smallest specimens, called snapper, are a great introductory fish since they eat everything and require no special gear. But the bigger cocktail blues and ever larger gators can reach 20 to 30 pounds. They're well known for their blitzes where they surround schools of bait fish and devour everything in their path. It's really quite the sight. Snook are part of the Centropomidae family, with six genera native to the East Pacific and six found in the West Atlantic Ocean. From Florida and California through Mexico and South America, they inhabit beaches, estuaries, and mangroves, where they load up on baitfish and crustaceans. Their streamlined appearance and prominent lateral lines suggest speed and power, 
which becomes evident when anglers hook into specimens over 30 and 40 inches. Now that you know a little about each species, let's talk about how to keep them in good health. If you're angling for sport, you want to release every fish in the best possible condition to increase their chances of survival. While fighting fish can be fun, it can exhaust them, so you should make an effort to land all fish quickly to help them conserve their energy. Since they're going to be spent when you land them, it's best to leave the fish in the water as long as possible so it can continue to breathe. Preserving the slime coat is a huge factor in any fish's survival. Using a knotless rubberized net to hold the fish is the benchmark for proper handling technique. Nylon and cotton nets tend to remove this slime and irritate sensitive parts, so a smooth net bag is a better choice. Don't use your hands to touch the fish unless absolutely necessary. If you must, then follow these points. Wet your hands first to preserve the fish's slime coat. Use two hands to fully support the weight of the fish. Be sure your grip is gentle so you don't crush the fish. And avoid touching sensitive organs like the eyes, gills, and fins. When you finally release the fish, it should look healthy. If it doesn't have much kick in it, or it starts to turn belly up, gently hold it in the water until you watch it come back to life before letting it go. While it's not my favorite approach, some species like bass, striper, and snook can handle a pinch grip, but lipping should never be attempted with other species like trout because you can easily break their jaws. If you are going to lip a fish, they should be held vertically, otherwise their weight needs to be supported with two hands to avoid damage. However you decide to handle your fish, watch out for teeth, spiny fins, sharp gill plates, and powerful jaws which can all damage your fingers. You also want to be cautious of sticking your hands where a hook might snag you. Lastly, taking photos of fish may feel like it heightens your experience, but it's actually pretty distracting. Toggling back and forth between holding a net, snapping a photo, and releasing a fish isn't really necessary. It feels like more of an addiction than anything else, and it just puts the fish at risk. Over the years, I've learned that laying a fish on the ground and prodding them with hands just for a picture isn't the best behavior, and it sets a bad example for other anglers. These days, I try to bring a net and limit the photos I take, but nobody's perfect. So what did we cover today? There are tons of different species for anglers to chase after. Some are big, some are fragile, some prefer cool water, and some are tricky to find. As you do your own research, I think you'll find that safe handling, caring for the environment, and taking the time to learn a bit more about them will come naturally to you. I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.